I just want to thank everyone for coming today. My name is Joel Kramer. I'm the Agricultural Specialist at the Resource Conservation District of Greater San Diego County. <coughs> and we're putting on this event on uh, with funding from the California Department of Food and Agriculture based on a demonstration grant that we were awarded in partnership with rancher John Ostell of 4J Horse and Livestock. Um, and we have three uh, great speakers joining us today. Uh, firstly, Peter Fonestock of uh, NRCS will be speaking about uh, the soil properties affiliated with the Healthy Ranch. Palayo Alvarez of Audubon, California will be speaking about potential for habitat development um, on rangelands. And uh, Russell Chamberlain will also be joining to talk about his experience on the ground implementing grazing practices that have built the soil and the forage, uh, improved the forage and the habitat on his ranch in Santa Barbara County. Um, we've also got uh, Cody Hale here today. She's my coworker at the Resource Conservation District, and she is making sure that everything is running smoothly and that all of your uh, questions get answered either during the event or following. Um, so if you have a question during the event, please reach out to Cody. Um, I'm going to share a couple slides just to orient you to how things are going to be running today, and then I'll pass the baton over to uh, Peter. Um, so firstly, um, um, uh, we have a couple other partners that have contributed to this event. So um, uh, in addition to Russell and John um, and Palayo, uh, and Peter, we've also got some support from UCANR because this is a, a collaborative uh, series, conservation series about practices on working lands in San Diego. Um, and I want to thank uh, Tracy Nelson, who um, manages the uh, ranch where John grazes, uh, Rancho Hamul, which is an ecological reserve under the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, and lastly, um, this is funded. The funds are managed by CDFA, but the funds come from California climate investments. So um, this effort um, is to build the carbon in the soil on these rangelands to combat the effects of climate change. So we're really achieving a lot of goals um, through this effort. So today, when you'd like to communicate, I'll just invite you to um, put your, your questions into the chat. Our speakers will be speaking for the first hour. Um, and there won't be time during that portion for you to ask questions. So save it for later on. Throw, throw your question in the chat if you'd like, and Cody will note that down. Um, and then in the last half hour, we'll be doing some smaller groups, um, as well as a larger group discussion to address some of those questions. Um, so while people are talking, just for the, the sake of keeping um, the demands on the internet down, please turn off your um, camera and also mute yourself. But then when we go into those breakout group, groups, you'll have a chance um, to speak uh, and have your video on. And then lastly, um, this is another um, feature that we're using today. You may have done this before in other Zoom groups, uh, but it's called a breakout room. We've got more than 50 people on the call today. And so we're gonna be breaking up into three different groups. And I'll tell you how to do this again a little bit later, but the groups will be discussing how to implement these conservation practices from different perspectives. So from the perspective of a rancher, John and Russell will be leading that discussion thinking about how we can implement these conservation practices in your community, on your lands. Um, Peter and uh, Palaya will be talking about it from a scientific and ecological perspective. And uh, for those of you that are interested in how partner organizations like nonprofits and government agencies can support these efforts, um, you can join me um, in that third breakout group. And this is how you can join. If you look on your Zoom screen, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see uh, four squares you can click on that um, and that'll send you um, into the room that you're interested in. If you happen to be, be joining by phone, I saw there's an iPhone on, for example, and you can't use your screen, just hang out in the main group and Cody will shoot you over to the group that you're interested in. So um, with that, I'm gonna leave the time to Peter uh, <laughs> Um Peter is um, a soil scientist at, um, at NRCS. Um, in, uh, in near Victorville. Um, and Peter uh, uh, advises land managers on the best land, on the best practices that they can do to cultivate soil health. Um, he's also adjunct faculty at Victor Valley, 
College, where he teaches soil science. So he'll be speaking on considerations, soil considerations for, for using lands. Um, and with that, Peter, go ahead and uh, share your screen. Right. Um, can, can everybody go ahead and see my screen now? Does that look okay? All right. And I, I sound I sound normal, like a real person. That's that's important too. Uh, it's a real honor for me to be here. I've, I've seen some of the names come into the through the waiting room, and I realize that uh, I'm in a pretty distinct group of my own colleagues. Uh, there's a, qu quite a few people here who could probably do a much better job on this particular subject than than me. But uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to take a little bit of time and, and maybe share some uh, information about soils that I hope you'll find practical. There's a lot of information on this, and they've only given me 20 minutes. Anybody who knows who knows me knows that 20 minutes is just me getting warmed up. But I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do my best to to zip through this. And um, as uh, as Joel said, uh, they'll if there if there probably won't be time for questions in it, but I'll be be glad to try to answer anything either after the after the presentation through email or even in the breakout rooms. Okay, let's see if I can make this happen. I've got some slides here that I think most everybody is probably familiar with, so I'm going to really kind of rip through these slides without really reading through them. I have a defin definition here of working landscapes. A lot of you folks are, are going to know exactly what I mean by that, but but because there's so many there's so many acres just in California, and I'm only considering California. But I mean, there's a there's a whole wide country out there that has working landscapes. But because there's so much that's held in trust, there's so many ranchers and farmers out there who are interested in managing the, managing these these uh, landscapes. Um, we have good reason, as I say at the bottom there, to determine how best to manage these lands. So then I want to I want to go in quickly. As I said, this is my real quick introduction. Ecosystem services. Are probably a lot of people again are very familiar with this. What I really want to point out in this particular one is not what, what they are or describe them, but just to, just to let people know that we need, as humans, we really need to be actively involved in interacting with our landscapes. And I think that's what the speakers are going to be speaking about as well uh, this afternoon. So uh, a lot of times we just look at sort of the natural landscape and try to focus on that. But, but I'm going to propose that we, we as, as managers, we as people who are using those landscapes really need to be involved with with how we manage them. Okay, and then I'm gonna run into the next, the next little definition here, and that's social, what, and th this isn't for me, you can see my, my, um, uh, my citation at the bottom, so this is not original with me, social ecological services. Again, this, this is something that sort of ties onto that last slide that uh, typically humans, us folks, have not, been, have not been regarded as being important in, in shaping these landscapes, but yeah, we've been on the land uh, for a couple hundred years in some cases, we certainly have have inputted, have had an input in what those lands look like today. We've shaped that we've shaped those lands. So the, the reality, as I say here, is that our human influence is responsible for the current functioning of, of ecosystems. And I would also say that as we move forward, it's going to be more and more important for us to be involved in that so that we continue to shape those ecosystems the way that we actually want them to, to be shaped. And that would be in a way to be most productive for what we want to do with them. So here's kind of my little summary of that one. Uh, maintaining or en enhancing these social ecological services really relies on our human practices, our cultures, so that we can create processes that are desirable. And I think probably that's why people are here today. They want to try to learn from, from, uh, from experts who are actually working the land, who actually have made some of these things work. Maybe some of you folks have those questions as well. Okay, so now we move into sort of the meat of this this particular thing, and this and this is what I'm calling resource concerns, and this may mean uh, may, may be a different uh, each each person here may think of something different when they think of resource concerns, but here's the definition again. Uh, this comes from from our agency as well, the SEEP the SEEP program in the NRCS. They're they're also part of this. The next couple of slides, you'll see that they they have contributed to that as well. And again, I, I give you a citation at the bottom that you might find interesting that has more information. But what are resource concerns? Typically, degradation of soil, water, air, plant, animal resources. They, they get degraded to the, to the extent that either sustainability or what we want to use that resource for is impaired. The, the, the working lands that we, re, that we want to provide goods, provide goods and services are not able to do that. We need to do something or we want to do something to sort of fix fix the problem and make that and make those 
that those systems actually work the way we want them to. We want them to be to improve at the at, we want them to maintain at the very least, and hopefully we want them to improve. Okay, so here's some graphs again from the from the, the seat program. I think within RCS put a lot of these together. I just literally stole them from them. But you can see here resource concerns, and this is just the soil ones. Now, where I'm going to go with this is I want you to kind of look at at the the top the top four or five here, and you can see that it's your, there's a couple of different kinds of erosion, water and wind erosion. There's some organic matter depletion, which I'm not going to directly address in this case, but then you can also see there's there's gully erosion, which I won't which I won't directly address either. Uh, there's just too much in all these topics, but I'm going to combine all those into erosion, and then you'll see that there's that there's stream bank erosion, and then there at the very bottom there's soil erosion. So what we really see here is except for except for the compaction and except for organic matter depletion, the main resource concern for soil seems to be erosion. So that's going to come into play here in just a second, or maybe more than a, more than a second in a few seconds as we move through this. So that's that's the soil resource concerns that have been listed. Now here's plant resource concerns, and look again. It says um, almost either almost fifty percent or more than fifty percent of all non-federal rangelands had had listed noxious or invasive plants, plant productivity, uh, health and vigor, or forage quality and palatability as being the top three priorities. So I'm going to link these two, two together. I'm going to link the, 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 res, the soil resource concerns and the plant resource concerns together. And again, I'm taking a somewhat simplistic approach on this. Uh, we could really dive into this a lot deeper. And I know that I'm not going to I'm not going to hit all the possible points. And some of you who have been working on these lands are going to say, well, you know, you might have missed this. And you might have missed that. And I, I would agree with you right up front that I probably have missed some things. But what I'm hoping to do is to tie these two things together. So with some practical, some practical, um, maybe advice or some uh, some thoughts, if you will, on how we might be able to manage these resource concerns, combine them together, the plant and the soils. I think I'll show you how to, how that. I hope I'll be able to show you how that actually works. Okay, so this is this is my premise here. The soil management is going to impact not only the soil resource concerns but the plant resource concerns. So that's that's the premise of where we're going. I've given kind of given you the background on that. I've kind of, and let's let's kind of move forward and see see what I mean by that. So first of all, I just wanted to put everybody on the same playing field. Uh, soils vary across the landscape. That this is just a three di three dimensional graphic of what that, that might look like. Here's a, it's a soil map from someplace, and it basically shows you how soil scientists might identify different portions of the landscape with different soils. And each one of those soils um, is going to have different different properties. Uh, without getting into all that, because the temptation for me as a soil scientist is to talk in, in, in great depth about everything soil on each slide, but I'm going to just try to hit the, hit the, skip the waves, if you will. So what I want to show you in this particular one, this particular uh, graphic here, is this solid line here. I don't know if you can see my, my, uh, my mouse or not, but this solid line here represents biological diversity in plant growth. And you can see that, um, that the way this line is shaped, the surface of the soil, the surface of the soil down to say maybe a foot and a half is critical, is where most of the biological di diversity, where it's where all the plant growth, of course, occurs. And it's where any of our management impacts is going to have the most impact, either negatively or positively on that. So that's, again, there's a lot we can unpack and look at in this, but I'm just, I just want to point that one out. I just want to say that the, the, the surface of the soil, where the soil meets the atmosphere, if you will, that's, that's the port. That's the portion of the soil that we really need to be most concerned with. For what we're interested in, that's that's where either the mistakes are going to be made or the advances are going to be made. So we're going to concentrate on that. So to concentrate on that, to look at that, we need to understand soil physical properties. I'm just going to focus on physical properties here. A lot of you folks know that there's a lot more than just physical. We can talk chemical. We can talk a lot of stuff. But just in the interest of time, just going to look at the soil physical properties. And if I pass out here because I'm talking too fast, just give me a second. I'll pop back up again after I get a breath or two. I'll just keep going. Okay, soil physical properties. What's the importance about them? They influence how soils will function in an ecosystem. And they, for, our, for our purposes, they determine how we can manage soils in the best way. They're going to they're gonna, to, to help us choose BMPs, best management practices. For uh, They also will determine the growth, the occurrence, and how well different plant species might actually grow. And then finally, they provide a regulation for um, water, nutrients, chemical pollutants to move through that. 
you, you can see there's a lot of stuff we could talk about in there, but let's just keep it on the surface. I'm just going to throw these one out here as common soil physical properties. I'm not going to go through all of these. I'm actually going to focus on the first four, texture, structure, uh, bulk density, and porosity. The other ones are, are, are not completely unimportant, but for, for the purposes of this discussion, we'll just leave them in there. But I wanted to throw, throw them all out there so people have an idea of what we're talking about. Okay, what is soil texture? Look at, let's look at the first one, the first uh, soil physical property. What is that one? A quick definition is just the proportions of sand, silt, and clay particles. That's what makes up a soil, sand, silt, and clay particles. It's the proportions of those in any given soil. It's what most of us think of as the feel of the soil. Uh, when I talk to different groups, all the way from like uh, grade school kids to, to whatnot, I talk about how this is the most important part property and actually understanding and knowing your soil texture makes you, makes you a, a pretty smart soil scientist. If you're good at this, and you got this, got this nailed down. You're about 60% of the way through just being a, a top-notch soil scientist, no matter what, what they throw at you. And it's really, really, really critical, really important to be able to identify uh, what your soil texture actually is. So not surprising then that I'd call it the most influential property. And it affects a lot of anything that has to do with water moving through the soil. Soil texture is gonna be responsible for a good portion of that water infiltration, water storage, percolation, drainage, also porosity, which, which again goes back to, to some of the water, the water properties moving or water properties in soil. And finally, soil density, the, which I'm calling here just simply the response of soil to being manipulated. So that's in red for a purpose. We're going to kind of come back and sort of tie that all in together. I've thrown this out at uh, this particular table out at you guys. Uh, I don't want you really to go through it, but I've highlighted some things there that you can actually just sort of maybe quickly, quickly key in on. Uh, the blue is just the different particles. If you had a dominant, if you knew your soil texture and you had a dominant uh, particle in there, let's just say your soil was pretty sandy and you're interested in any certain properties, for instance, aeration, that's kind of a, for most of us, probably a no brainer. If we had a, a, a soil that was pretty sandy, it would probably be quite well aerated. Drainage rate would probably be good. Compactability would, would be low. And then you can do the same with the other ones here. I'm, ass I'm assuming that these slides will be made available. So if anybody has any interest after the, after the presentation that they could actually take a little bit longer look at some of these things if they found them interesting. But, th but, th but the idea is here is for you to look at the property or behavior and to see all the different, the different properties that are actually associated and how we can actually, just looking at our soil texture, we can actually make a prediction about how our soil is actually gonna behave out there in the field. Okay, the second physical property that we want to look at quickly is soil structure. And this just takes those, those, those sand, silt, and clay particles and just arrange them, arranges them. And without, without discussing any more than that, let's just call it the dirt clods, the aggregates or peds is a more scientific way to do it. It's the shape of the, of the soil when it breaks up. So that's what soil structure actually is. Now, what's important about soil structure? I kind of already alluded to the, the soil texture. I pointed that one out as being the most important probably the most important of the soil physical properties. But soil structure also provides porosity. And some people don't actually realize that, but it provides porosity. Those spaces between those dirt clods, if you will, is actually their spaces. And those spaces get to be filled with either air or water. Because their spaces, they allow, they allow the soil to transmit water and air rapidly. That's good for, that's good for plants, that root development. Nutrients and microorganisms like to be there too, because that's the highway for water running down through the soil a lot of times. So let's, let's be where the water is. And that's where you'll find nutrients. That's why you'll find a lot of microorganisms. So soil structure uh, is, is critically important. Texture, of course, is, is the first one there, but, but the texture is going to influence the structure. Here's an example of just, uh, just a quick slide of platy structure in here. Now, this is not desirable. This is often a surface structure, and you can see it does not look good. I mean, even if you didn't really know what, what it was called, technically, you would look at that and say, that doesn't look too good. That's not really what you want to have on the, on the surface. And what, you can what you'll find is, is that if you're looking at, say, water movement, some of you may have seen this. This is not, a, not an original graph of our chart of mine. This is quite common on the internet. But I want to point over here to the right where it says platy structure. Do you look? Can you see the path that water has to take? You can't go in a straight line. The straighter the straighter line that water can move through the soil, the better it is for for anything that's growing in the soil, or for pretty much for any use we want to make of the soil. So you can see that this water is going to have to go more horizontal rather than vertical to actually to actually get anywhere. That's that's not what we really want. We want to avoid that. 
So soil structure you can kind of see here is, is, is critically important. These other structures are all natural structures and they're all pretty good structures. Some of them are at the surface like granular and then these other ones are actually subsurface structures. Without getting into that, although the temptation is there for me to do that, let's move on to the next slide. So what I, what I say here is soil texture and structure together, those two physical properties, they're gonna help determine the ability of the soil to hold water, how well that soil can actually conduct or, or move water and air. It's not just water, water and air through the soil, both directions. We, we, need, to, we need to move air in and out of the soil, carbon dioxide out, air back in. How soils behave when used as a construction medium, that's kind of the engineering thing. We don't, we're not too concerned about that. And how soils behave under any kind of agricultural use, we're more concerned with that. So soil texture and structure together, we can see those are pretty important to know that. Now, the third property that I kind of listed in there was soil bulk density. Now there's a lot of, there's a lot of words on here. Typically, I don't like to have this many, but um, I want you just to focus that when you have a fine textured soil, your bulk density is lower. That sometimes counts, seems counterintuitive because you think, oh, I have a clay soil, it's gonna have higher bulk density. No, it's the other way around because well-structured soils, which tend to be soils that have more fine particles, that's the silts and the clays, tend to have more pore space. The pores are smaller, but they tend to have more total pore space. They also tend to be better structured, have better structure. And if you remember from a couple of slides ago, that structure actually adds more porosity as well into the soil. So bulk density is usually lower because there's more air space in a given volume for a heavier textured soil, a clayey soil. So with that, so if there's more pore space, then fine textured soils, clayey soils or soils that tend to be more clay should be able to be compacted more. I mean, there's more air space and then uh, technically we should be able to squish more of that air space out. And that's actually, that, that is actually true. There's a lot more in that one as well, but let's just leave it again. And just, just with that, with those basic truths there. Okay. So my point then in making that is that so that soil density, bulk density can be increased, increased abnormally. Now increased means less porosity, higher bulk density, less porosity. So I say tractors to cows, it could be anything, it could be humans, it could be any of us. Traffic squeezes out pore space. Now I haven't given any, any conditions yet. I've just sort of made that blanket statement. So that's one way, just putting weight on the soil is gonna actually cause that, cause that bulk density to actually change. But it could also be, could be increased by just, just by tillage or just by clearing the land. That's, that's less, less um, intuitive, if you will, but if you have a significant organic matter at the surface and most of our organic matter, what, what we have is going to be at the surface. Once we disturb that by, by any kind of land land degradation, land clearing, whatever it might be, we actually expose that, that organic matter to the, to the atmosphere. We, we, will, we will lose it. That actually takes up space. It actually provides pore space. And when it's gone, the soil settles. It becomes more compacted, thus less, less uh, pore space. Any kind of disturbance on the surface also destroys our structure. And once we destroy our structure, we realize we don't have any, we don't have uh, that the same kind of porosity that we had before. Here's Peter, a graph. A, a quick heads up, you got just one minute left. Sorry oh, gosh. to cut you okay. off so early. Okay, I think I can do it in two minutes if you give me two. But you can see here we've got compaction. This, 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 and then you can see some pictures here. Uh, I'll let you read them. You can read them faster than I can say them. Compaction and erosion. This is what it looks like. We actually lose in a compacted soil, we lose, we lose air. Most of we lose air and we increase solids in a given volume. Sometimes it's not obvious. Sometimes you, can, you can't even really see it in the soil. This one is more obvious. Here's some more obvious ones. This is, this is from tillage. So my point here is infiltration and erosion are the main problems behind many of those resource concerns I listed, I listed earlier. And compaction is often that driving factor. Those impacts of compaction are broad. You can see this here, this is a surface compaction. Uh, there is stuff growing, but you can see this might be what it looks like on your, on your rangeland. Not really what you want. You might end up, this is cropland picture, I know, but you might end up with in, in, reduced infiltration. You can transfer that to the, to the field, to the rangeland as well. What about erosion? Same thing, you've got the compaction. Ultimately, I know there's a lot of traffic and the site's not good, but look at this, nothing's growing there. Nothing at all will grow there. Here's, here's heavy continuous grazing. Here's the same site after it's been managed. Again, compaction, erosion will, will, lead, will lead to that. So uh, two more slides here. I might have 15 seconds left. My, my final thoughts here, and this sort of ties it all up. It's important to know what soil textures you have. Soil texture is gonna give you information about moisture. 
Moisture status is what's really critical for deciding if soil traffic will result in compaction. You cannot compact the dry soil. I know some engineers will disagree with that, but for our purposes, it won't compact. And that's what we want. So we want to know what is our moisture status. And that's going to be dependent on our texture. So finally, just in summary, uh, I'll just read my summary. Manage managing to minimize compaction will increase infiltration, reduce both wind and water erosion, maintain plant maintain plant productivity and diversity and decrease pressure from noxious and invasive weeds. I think all those things will happen and those are those kind of tie all those soil and plant resource concerns together. Hopefully that gives you kind of a taste and you find something useful in that. I'll take any questions, obviously much later. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Peter. That, that was really great uh, foundational lay for the next discussions that'll come up. But we just want to check out, check in with all of you in the audience. Um, Cody has a poll to share to see what you thought about some of these soil concepts and what you've seen on your land. So take a minute to answer this poll. Um, and then uh, I'll introduce you to our next speaker. And for those of you who are wondering, um, I didn't catch all of that. Are we going to be able to have this available later? Yes, the recording is going to be available online. We're going to share all the notes from these presentations and also the slides we'll make available to you as well. So don't worry if you miss something, we'll be sure to share it with you um, later on. Um, so our next speaker is Palayo, Dr. Palayo Alvarez, but before, before Palayo starts, we're just going to toss you a little poll and see what you see what you're thinking about soil. Give us just a moment. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, well, it looks like erosion is the top concern here and that's great because uh, I know the later speakers are going to be focusing on that. So thanks so much. Um, now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Playa Alvarez. He's currently the California director for the Audubon Society's Conservation Ranching Initiative. Um, uh, but prior to that, he was working at the Carbon Cycle Institute. Um, the Carbon Cycle Institute focuses on building healthy soils and sequestering carbon and then when he was working as the director of outreach and partnerships there. Um, and before that, he was working at the California Rangeland Conservation uh, Coalition, where he coordinated research and outreach. Uh, Palayo has a master's in animal science from Oklahoma State and a PhD in ecology from UC Davis. So Palayo, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Joel. And um, like Peter, I'm also honored to be uh, on this panel. Um, I'm gonna provide you with a brief overview of um, Audubon's conservation ranching initiative to try to illustrate the important ecological role that uh, ranching and grazing play, uh, particularly in California. So the initiative, if I can move my slides. There you go. So the, uh, the purpose of the initiative is to create market-based incentives that reward ranchers for protecting and enhancing grassland bird habitat on ranch lands. It was started in the Midwest in uh, around 2016, and it was brought to California about two years ago in 20, 2019. It's the, the initiative was designed to stem the loss of, of grasslands and birds. As you can see, in the last 50 years, we have uh, seen a lot of declines in all bird species, but grassland bird species seem to be uh, declining. Uh, in, in a more severe, severe way, uh, more, more dramatic declines, almost um, over 50% um, of the grassland birds have been lost in, in the last 50 years. So again, it was started in the Midwest to, uh, to try to, to stem that, uh, that loss of bird habitat and obviously bird populations as well. Uh, we work with this concept of, of birds as indicators of, of rangeland health, which others have have used as well. So, you know, we know what, what's good for, for the rangelands is good for, for the birds. So by working on um, stewardship of rangelands, we're gonna be able to improve uh, bird habitat as well. Here in California, about 47% uh, of our grass and bird species are also vulnerable. And it's a combination of uh, climate change and, and habitat loss that are creating those uh, or exacerbating those vulnerabilities. Uh, you see the picture of a Western meadowlark one of the most iconic grassland birds um, here in the West Coast. And it could be if, you know, just thinking about climate change only, if, if the, we reach the 1.5 um, 
centigrade uh, degrees temperature rise, the whole um, range for the Western metal art will be extirpated from, from California. So the threats of grassland birds are, again, it's a combination of, of climate change and, and habitat loss, very similar to the threats to uh, actual grasslands and very similar to the threats to, uh, to our, our ranchers as well. Again, that combination of, of climate change and, and uh, conversion to, uh, to other land uses. So that's the bad news. The good news is that we could do something about it if we, again, we work on uh, protecting rangelands and also on their management. And, um, our initiative works mostly with, uh, with grazing as, as one of the main tools to achieve that, that range on health and kind of build that, that ecosystem from, from the ground up, working from um, healthy soils, healthy plants, healthy uh, uh, animal communities, uh, good habitat, big habitat for birds. So uh, just another way of, of illustrating how um, the health of, of, of the ecosystem is gonna, is gonna determine the, the health of the bird populations by working on our uh, healthy soils and the healthy plant communities on the left-hand side of the, of the screen, we're gonna be able to, uh, again, build the ecosystem from the ground up, uh, sequestering more carbon and, and actually making sure that that uh, energy in the form of carbon flows through the entire ecosystem all the way to, um, to uh, bird habitats and, and obviously birds as well. So we cannot um, build uh, more bird habitat or improve bird habitat without working on, on soils and, and vegetation. So a program, what basically we do is, is uh, we become partners in sustainable land management. We engage uh, ranchers in, in improving their land for uh, bird habitat, but other ecosystem services as well. Uh, the ranchers get a um, certification that they can attach to their products as uh, uh, the label is called, is uh, graced on Audubon certified land. So it's a uh, bird friendly land. Uh, the initiative connects ranchers with premium markets. Audubon does not guarantee a price premium for the rancher. The rancher has to negotiate that themselves, but we do help ranchers with, with marketing and promotion of their bird friendly products. The four pillars of our uh, program or protocols are habitat management, forage and feeding, animal health and welfare, and environmental sustainability. The one that, um, that sets our certification apart from other certifications is the habitat management. Uh, we work with ranches, creating habitat management plans for their operations, all the, the land that they graze. Uh, and obviously the focus is, is to improve bird habitat. Uh, for forage and feeding, um, operators that have to be grass-fed, grass-finished. Um, for animal health and welfare, ranchers have to uh, achieve a global animal, animal partnership uh, certification at level four. And uh, the environmental sustainability protocols basically ban the use of chemicals like pesticides, herbicides, and uh, fertilizers as well. So again, uh, what sets us apart is this creation of habitat management plans are very similar to other conservation plans that you may be familiar with, like the NRCS conservation plans or even carbon farm plants. But uh, for us, for the initiative, the focus is to protect and improve uh, bird habitat. So we develop a um, specific list of bird species that, that we are uh, uh, concerned about and that we would like to improve habitat for. The initiative uh, provide, provides monitoring uh, as well. Monitoring is not part of the certification, but Audubon is, is really interested in, in figuring out you know, whether this program is actually improving bird habitat. Um, monitoring is conducted right now by our partners, uh, Point Blue Conservation um, Science, and uh, some of you are familiar with their range and monitoring network, basically monitor for soils, vegetation, and obviously uh, birds as well. Our science team has developed this uh, so-called bird friendliness index that it is a metric that we use again to assess, evaluate whether those uh, ranchers that are ACR certified are actually uh, improving habitat, combines um, measurements of abundance, diversity, and resilience, and compares 
ACR certified ranches with uh, surrounding areas. And, and again, it's a way to, uh, to measure the uh, success of the program. Because the program is very uh, young to California, again, we've only, we just certified our first three ranchers just recently. So we don't have a data yet to, uh, to show to, um, whether again, the, the program is doing what's designed to do. Um, our initiative is present in uh, 15 different states. We have 139 ranches enrolled, covering about 2.3 million acres. In California, we have um, right now actually it's uh, six certified uh, operators and 14 other ranches are enrolled in the program. They're not yet fully certified. And that um, approximately, so certified ranchers cover about 70,000 acres. Uh, once we uh, certify those that are enrolled in the program, the program will be covering about 600,000 acres throughout the state. And that's all I have. That's a list of the uh, certified branches, um, just recently certified branches in California that you can actually buy bird-friendly uh, beef uh, from them. Again, about by the end of this year, we'll have uh, uh, 11 uh, ranchers uh, certified in the program, and we have more demand. We have more ranchers interested in the in the initiative that that we can certify right now. So our goal is to try to uh, build our capacity and build partnerships to uh, be able to uh, to meet the, the demand that we that we hear from uh, from the ranchers. Well, Palaya, thanks so much for showing us how the working lands are actually habitat as well. Um, it'll be interesting to talk more uh, later on during the discussion about how people might integrate habitat management into their grazing management plans and vice versa. Um, but along that line, I'll pass the baton over to Cody. Uh, we've got another poll on this topic for all of you. So, Cody? Yeah, great. I just launched a poll for everyone. If uh... I'm going to go ahead and give us an answer. Our question is, how important is habitat management on the land you own, manage, or support? Uh, looks like the majority of us, it's a top priority. Um, no one is not a priority, which is great. And uh, <laughs> looks like there's a, a few of us here who are giving some consideration, but um, are interested in uh, making that more of a priority. So that's awesome to hear. All right. Well. Thanks, Cody, for that interesting poll. And um, I think we'll put it into action now. Um, all of these ideas that Peter and Palayo introduced. Uh, Russell Chamberlain is here from Ted Chamberlain Ranch in Santa Barbara County. Um, and he has been uh, implementing a lot of these practices as co-manager of the ranch, along with his cousin, Mary Hayden. Um, they're based in Los Olivos. And he, uh, Russell is building on the legacy of his grandfather, who started the ranch in 1929. He's the third generation. and um, his, his children are getting involved in the ranch as well. Um, and uh, Russell was also the recipient of a CDFA Healthy Soils Demonstration Grant, uh, such as this one that we're taking part in, um, but his was for compost application on rangelands. So um, Russell, I'll pass it over to you and thanks for joining us today. Very good. Can you hear me and, and can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Very good. I am uh, new to this. So um, pardon me here. Let's see. Is it all looking good? All looking yeah. good? Yeah, we see your screen and we can hear you. It's great. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you for allowing myself to share what we are doing on our family ranch. I'm excited to share with you and have lots of slides. I'll be going through them fast because I, I got a lot to share. And so hold on to your hats, here we go. Uh, my grandfather, Ted Chamberlain, bought this 8,000 acre ranch in Los Olivos, California. Then met and married my grandmother, Ailey, pictured here with their dog, Lady. I was born and raised on the ranch, then went to school at Chico State and returned to the ranch in 2009. In 2015, we changed managers and our management style, and I started co-managing the ranch with my cousin, Mary Hayden, and is also when we started utilizing the principles of holistic management 
and planned grazing. Here's a map of the ranch in yellow. Santa Barbara is in the lower right hand corner. When I started use, utilizing Google Earth Pro a few years ago for mapping projects on the ranch, I realized just how big it is and what an impact our decision making is having on a larger scale. Here's a picture of myself and deceased father and would like to read you our grazing goal. is to maximize forage production, increase soil carbon, increase soil water holding capacity, protect water quality, improve pasture nutritional profile and increase the length of the grazing season. Well, this sounds simple and wonderful, but it's taken many years to figure this out about what each idea means and how to implement them here. And we are still learning and still modifying to, to uh, achieve our goal. In 2014, we got involved with a program called Rancher to Rancher, which takes a small area and start to experiment and experience the principles of holistic management and planned grazing. In 2014, we started with a lot of bare soil, which is the way the ranch was grazed, and we were also in a drought. The goal here was to trample down the winter growth in the summertime and to cover the soil with litter, break up the soil sur surface with cattle hooves, and build up the soil organic matter, improve the pasture. We set up a monitor monitoring transect on the site, as well as a controlled transect on the outside and moderate almost yearly with Richard King, who is guiding us through this process. Our typical rainfall is between 12 and 15 inches. And in 2014 and 2015, we were in a terrible drought, which we are still in. I was impressed with the amount of forage that was grown in 2015, which is a light rain year, as you can see on those photos. Here's a picture of the cattle that we, were, that we put in the test site during the summer. We put as many cattle as possible in for about an hour, then let them back out. We want them to trample the vegetation, urinate and dung on it, and not eat too much as we're trying to build up the soil health. Peter Donovan with the Soil Carbon Coalition did a baseline soil test, including the amount of carbon. And over the past four years, the carbon has increased about 1% from 2.65% to 3.72% carbon. This is impressive and we are uh, expecting to see more plant species diversity and increased yield to come. Carbon acts like a sponge. For every one part carbon attracts eight parts water, which is really important for us. And about 58% of soil organic matter is made up of carbon. We are not implementing this intense animal impact on the rest of the ranch due to the labor costs that would be involved. However, it is a great way to learn and try new things and to adapt and see if we would want to implement this on places where it would be beneficial. We are, however, planning, uh, doing planned grazing on the rest of the ranch that addresses bare soil, soil organic matter, when and how much uh, the growing vegetation is being eaten and the recovery time before the cattle are allowed to regraze an area. When grass is constantly being grazed, it has to take the energy from the roots to grow instead of using photosynthesis with its leaves. We are also trying to keep the grass in stage two or in a vegetative state. The plant has the most energy and nutrients in, and we have experienced that by achieving much higher weight gains on our stock or cattle than uh, historically. Some of the other big changes we made in 2015 was to combine our multiple herds. We now run uh, replacement heifers and cows together and use calving knees or low birth weight bulls on everything. And this has been a time saver um, as had not to pull a calf in many years. Um, then we also have a separate stalker yearling program we run from November to June. Uh, seeing more growth here in 2016 and 2017, uh, we also have some more rainfall and I'll have to update some more pictures in the future, but moving on here. So soil temperature, which is uh, really important to myself. And if we look at the diagram here, when your soil temperature is about 140 degrees, the soil bacteria die. When soil temperature is about 130 degrees, 100% 100 of, of moisture loss is through evaporation and transpiration. At 100 degrees, 15% moisture is used for forage growth and 85% moisture is lost through evaporation and transpiration. So we really shoot for like 70 degrees, 100% moisture is used for forage growth. And with bare soil, about 84% is lost to evaporation versus covered soil, 
where 10% is lost to evaporation. So if you want to receive more rain, the easiest way is to keep the soil covered to retain what you just received. To keep the soil covered with plant litter, like a mulch, one would apply to a garden. We also follow the four ecosystem processes, which are the water cycle, mineral cycle, energy flow, and community dynamics. With this water cycle, we wanna slow down the water to infiltrate it into the soil and prevent it from run running off. We do this by keeping the soil covered with plant litter so that the soil temperature stays cooler and prevents evaporation. We also want deep rooted plants, abundant soil life, good soil porosity, and biologically active soil. With the mineral cycle, we with the um, with the mineral cycle, we want to get the dung and urine spread up by rotating the cattle versus on continuous continuous grazing where they like to loaf in the same areas. We also stop using dewormers that kill dung beetles. We view dung beetles and soil microbes as part of our livestock, which break down the manure and minerals into plant available nutrients. The energy cycle: we want as many year-round living plants as possible. The more photosynthesis that is taking place, the more sugars the plants are exuding into the soil to feed the soil microbes, as well as, the, as more forage for our livestock. And the community dynamics, the more different plant species, such as annuals, perennials, warm seasons, and cool seasons that are growing, create a more complex, diverse ecosystem, which is healthier for our livestock. This is a nice diagram by Grassfed Solutions that I uh, snagged. And we're gonna focus first on the lower left-hand corner of that diagram where that black dotted line is. Um, and underneath that is stage one um, for the grass. And right there, the grass has a lot of protein and a lot of energy and sugar, but it's not going to sustain cattle. It'd be like us trying to live on shots of wheatgrass. But stage two, just above that, is the rapid growth. We want um, to graze once the third leaf develops um, the plant is now using photosynthesis to grow where before it was not established and relying on that plant energy to grow. There's a lot of protein and now lots of carbohydrates. This will put muscle and bone on cattle. They also get a slick, shiny hair, strong immune system and a high weight gain. This is when you wanna be rotating fast through the pastures to take advantage of this before the grass wants to go into stage three. Stage three uh, is when the plants mature and they wanna reproduce and photosynthesis slows down by 85%. There's now more structural carbohydrates and less protein. Uh, the weight gain decreases, however this, is, however this high carb diet is great for finishing cattle. And um, now you'd also want to use a slow rotation. Here you can see young green grass in stage one. It has lots of protein and energy, yet lack, lacking fiber. When the cattle get a mouthful of this young grass mixed with all this old fiber to aid in digestion, they do great. We generally start supplementing the cows about 20% of the ration with hay starting at Thanksgiving and going till the end of January when the new green grass is strong enough. This year we have not had to feed in hay and won't have to until Christmas time and looks like the rain is finally on its way and we may not to feed, have to feed hay at all this year. Here the cows turn into the new pasture and loving it. I'm constantly planning, monitoring, and replanting the grazing. The cattle graze on the right side of the fence line where not much green grass is left and will probably die before the next rain event. Then we move the cattle to the left side. There's still great cover on the right side um, and the, on the soil and uh, more grass will grow once we get more rain. The cattle have never looked so good at this time of year, even when we were feeding hay. I try to monitor and keep a lots of records. However, it be can become a huge time commitment and overwhelming. And then I find myself falling behind. So I try to keep it simple, easy, and enjoyable. This is an image taken from NASA looking at the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. The red represents the amount of carbon buildup in the atmosphere over the winter and before the majority of the green growth in the United States. Now notice there is less carbon in the atmosphere, not very much red left. In late summer, because the power of all the summer growth of plants using photosynthesis and capturing the carbon and storing it in the ground for the plants to use. I'm also taken back when I see this and I remember to work with nature instead of against it. This is a, a great article 
called two degrees Celsius beyond the limit that was in the Washington Post. And I'll read that. Since 1895, the average temperature in Santa Barbara County has warmed by 2.3 degrees Celsius, according to the Post analysis. Neighboring Ventura County has heated up even more rapidly with an average temperature increase of 2.6 degrees Celsius since pre-industrial times. Ventura ranks as the fastest warming county in the lower 48 states. It's written by Scott Wilson, December 5th, 2019. I find this very concerning and farmers are slowly moving crops north so the, plant, so the plants can be growing in the environment that they are used to. This is also a huge motivator in keeping the soil covered not overgrazing and making sure that when it rains that every raindrop counts. Don't want a single raindrop to hit bare soil and creating a crust evaporating or washing away, creating erosion and going down to my neighbors. I want more rain and want it to last longer. I'm watching the weather forecast less because I'm setting up the soil to be able to capture and hold more water. Thus, I am increasing our, our rainfall. This picture on the left was taken May of 2017. This area of the ranch has heavy clay soils and was full of tall mustard and bull thistle. The heavy soil used to also split open in the summertime. With our rotational grazing, the mustard, mustard and the bull thistle is much less, as you can see on the picture to the right, with very little of the soil cracking. I am still amazed at this site and the other sites like this one, where a simple change in the grazing management has had this much impact. Here's another example of how the ranch used to be grazed on the left. I think this picture was taken in the fall of the early 2000s. I recreated the photo on the right and you can see how the spring is starting to flow again with all the green grass around it in the background. Our old oak trees are dying at an alarming rate due to the drought and warmer temperatures. I'm grateful that with our change in the grazing, that we have over 1,000 new sapling oak trees growing on their own. We only have a handful of trees that have grown on their own in the past 75 years. I'm amazed at how many trees are now growing without any help. All the stipa purple needle grass on this ranch used to have dead centers, very unhealthy and not very tall. As you can see in this picture, all the centers are healthy and alive. The plants are robust and taller and fuller than they ever have been. This is a graph showing the rainfall, rainfall in yellow. Our average rainfall is about 15 to 20 inches a year. The blue line is how many acres per cow we are carrying with a number per acre on the right axis. This area typically carries about 15 to 20 acres per cow per year. We have been as high as about 27 acres per cow and now we are down to about 16 acres per cow with less than nine inches of rainfall last year. I am encouraged that the blue line is continuing to trend downwards, even in a drought and warmer climate. Our carrying capacity is increasing because of the way we have changed our grazing. Something not shown on, on this graph, graph is our stalker cattle historically gained 250 pounds a season. We are maintaining that during a drought and getting 320 pound gains during a normal rain year. Another benefit of growing more grass and planned rotational grazing is that we are seeing more wildlife such as birds and nests in the grass, more deer and less squirrels. Squirrels favor bare soil where they can see their predators and don't like tall, thick grass. Here's an overview of the ranch with yellow lines representing an exist, all the existing fence lines. We have taken our largest pasture, which is about 2,600 acres and cross fenced it into five pastures of similar size each about 520 acres um, now that you can see in the red. This will now give us seven pastures of similar size to rotate through. I expect, I expect to be able to grow more grass and increase the number of stalker cattle we carry, especially during drought years. Prior to cross fencing, we were rotating between three pastures, the 2,600 acre pasture, one at 250 acres and the other at 800 acres. I could give the two smaller pastures plenty of recovery time before coming back to regraze, but could never give the big pasture enough recovery time for regrowth. In late spring of 2020 and 2021, we conducted two controlled burns of about 80 acres each shown in red and blue. 
We are doing it for vegetation type conversion from sagebrush to hopefully grasslands. These areas have burned for about 40 plus years and are thick and full of dry fuel. This is a monoculture of species where pigs and deer use it to bed down, as well as a few other species like it at certain times. I would rather have a polyculture of many grasses and forb species for livestock, as well as for wildlife. The control, the control burn is being conducted by the Santa Barbara County Fire Department for vegetation fire training. It's been a win-win for both of us. Here's a, here is the fire department burning the brush and some grass too. The picture on the left is what grew the following year after a, after a low rainfall year. There was a tremendous amount of diversity of grass species. We have been very careful to graze it lightly as we want to let the grass get established. The ecological outcome verification program through the Savory Institute is helping us monitor this site. In January of 2016, we wrote our carbon farm plan. There are 13 practices that are recognized which have helped with the grazing and compost on rangeland applications. Palayo helped with writing the plan. The site above is a compost on rangeland project we did with the NRCS and with Dr. Josh Schimmel from UCSB and Dr. Wendy Silver from UC Berkeley. Here is the applying of a one quarter inch of compost which the benefits are expected to last for 20 to 30 years. I got more results on that on the next slide, but also want to uh, make, mention that we want to make sure that the compost areas are being grazed. The compost is a jump start to get the nutrients and the carbon cycling improving, but it's grazing that needs to be the long term driving force to, to keep the improvements going. Here are the results for the past four years. We saw about a 20% increase every year, except for one, and we don't know why that year is different. This NRCS program led us to the Healthy Soils program of applying compost on 63 acres, which we have just completed with similar results. We, have, we also have an NRCS conservation stewardship program, 528 prescribed grazing program. We just started and last for, I believe, five years. Outline above is, is if compost was applied to about half the ranch, it would sequester about 639 metric tons of carbon a year. This page is also taken from our carbon farm plan as referencing the, the increase in the annual water holding capacity after 20 years, an increase of 493 acre feet of water. It's quite impressive. If you'd like more information regarding the compost program, please see the show notes or search the internet for carbon farming on the Central Coast for a 20 minute video. You can't manage what you don't monitor. I'm becoming a firm, a firm believer of the statement. These are some of the things that we are monitoring for on the carbon, on the compost sites, especially carbon, soil biology, percent organic matter, water infiltration rates, and a lot more. Uh, the rancher to rancher sites, we really focus on the water cycle, the mineral cycle, the energy flow, and the community dynamics. The hardest part of making these improvements is changing the way we think. If we want different results, then we must be open to doing things differently. Then it takes practice and patience before starting to see improvements, but it's so record, rewarding and encouraging. Grazing all comes down to management and how we are moving the cattle around for the best forage production as well as animal performance. It's not the cow, it's the how. This is a great illustration by Sacred Cow on the differences between continuous grazing and managed or planned grazing. And with that, um, these are a bunch of our partners. Um, I won't go down the list, but we wouldn't be able to do a lot of this work without these fantastic partners. So thank you. All right, Russell, thank you so much. It's really cool to see all that in action. Uh, you can really see the difference with your before and after pictures of what it looks like, not just from having more rainfall, but preparing for that rainfall with the techniques that you've used and being able to take advantage of it. So thanks, thanks for sharing. I'm sure people will have a lot of questions when we uh, have our discussion in a bit. In the meantime, we've got another poll for everyone. So um, Cody, take it away. Great, so uh, this time we are wondering um, which of these practices are you currently incorporating into your land or are you supporting others to implement? Um, 
We've got prescribed grazing, compost, application, rangeland planting, wildlife friendly fencing, and other. So uh, we've got lots of folks answering so far. It looks like prescribed grazing is something that um, most folks here are either implementing or supporting others in. That's awesome. And uh, a lot of fans of wildlife friendly fencing, which we love to see as well. So I'll go ahead and end that poll and sort of share results with you all, um, kind of see where everybody stands here. So awesome, thank you for participating. Thanks everyone for your questions. We, we saw some questions in the chat. Um, we're recording those to answer later or after the event. And as a reminder, um, all these materials will be available um, afterwards. We'll send you an email with links to all the information. Um, but I'm excited to um, introduce now uh, my partner, John Ostell. He's uh, the rancher at uh, Rancho Hamul in San Diego and the owner of 4J Horse and Livestock. John, um, to my left here, started ranching in California as a young man in the Owens Valley in the Eastern Sierra Nevada. Um, and today he's one of uh, just a few ranchers in California that has a grazing contract on state lands. Um, John is uh, a recipient along with our resource conservation district of the CDFA Healthy Soils Program grant for prescribed grazing at Rancho Home Rule. Um, and his training is in animal science um, from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo with a minor in agricultural business. Um, John has a lot of experience in the commercial end of the cattle business, and I was hoping he'd share with everybody how he got started with 4J Horse and Livestock. Oh, okay. Uh, well, thank, thanks, Joel. Um, <clears throat> like Joel said, I had a, I had a background in, in, uh, in commercial cattle, uh, cow-calf operation over in the Owens Valley and uh, left the uh, industry after a few years uh, to pursue, after a small stint with the farm credit system, uh, a few years with them. Uh, ended up uh, leaving the industry because I was not able to, uh, I was frustrated in trying to get, be able to start a, a ranch and we wanted to raise a family, my wife and I. So we ended up actually leaving the industry for about 30 years. And my uh, sons saw the, uh, the, um, pictures of me basically uh, in the Owens Valley and wanted to know that part of our life. And we got started with uh, raising cattle in 4-H here in the city. And so that's where we started. So we ended up uh, uh, raising 4-H cattle, uh, finding out what was happening in the industry 30 years afterwards. And we were down here in San Diego County and I was an insurance broker uh, that I'd uh, been doing for 30 years and we, found out that the industry had done a dramatic change in a 30 year time frame. So my sons pretty much got me back into it. We raised 4-H cattle and the boys, uh, we did a natural grass fed uh, product that we sent, uh, that we sold at the fair. The boys wanted to sell it all year round uh, as we were eating a steak from one of our steers around the dinner table. And I decided to say, well, let's, uh, I wanted to show the boys how to take the take an idea that they had and turn it into a business. And so that's how 4J Horse and Livestock was started. And uh, I've got three sons, Jake, Josh, and Jesse. And uh, of course, my wife, Liz, uh, you can see on our brand, uh, the L on top of the 4Js, and she's keeping us in, in line still today. So that's pretty much how, that, how we got started. So anyway, the boys wanted to sell it all year round. So that's how we started, the, started out there. And uh, and basically, you know, it was like either either one way or the other. We either were going to keep ranches fallow, or we were going to graze them. There was nothing in between that I, I that I could see at that time where you know we would do some type of managed grazing on these properties for uh, for wildlife, for rangeland improvement, and provide a solid food product to people that would like to have a, a healthy healthy product. Um, so basically that's when I talked to uh, uh, the Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, through a, a series of, of meetings. Uh, I met uh, Tracy Nelson, who is uh, the CDF W onsite reserve manager for Rancho Hamul and Hollenbeck. And, uh, and it was a go. We started off with a small number of acres looking to manage for, uh, um, for burrowing owls. 
uh, and then it expanded to where we are today, uh, where we're running on uh, a couple thousand acres with uh, management for uh, different reasons and different paddocks. So um, I don't know how far to go into this. Basically, the uh, the other thing that bothered me more than anything is uh, while we were pursuing getting back into the livestock business was we had two major wildfires down here in San Diego. And if you look them up in 03 and in 07, uh, the total of number of structures that were burned in 03 and 07 were just under 4,500 uh, residents and or properties or structures in San Diego County just from 2003 and 2007, both wildfires. So these ranches uh, that were previously grazed were sitting fallow at that time. Um, and um, it, it was it was interesting to me that they were just they were just fallow uh, when they had been have a history of grazing. So anyway, we're moving forward. It seems like the the not just as a San Diego County, but as a state of California, there's so much new science coming out to the advantages of grazing. Uh, right now that it's just yeah, uh, it's mind boggling though. and it's tough to keep up with, but it's super important to try to do so. So as a producer, uh, I'm, I'm just elated with all the new science based information that's coming out that uh, that ranchers or producers can choose uh, which direction to go one or two, maybe management practices that they can do to improve their own proper properties. Russell did an outstanding job of showing several different methods that's going on that's going on in his particular operation very very great job russell thank you very much for for doing that you you put a lot of time into it and it's it was a great program i enjoyed it very much so jumping to ours basically we're i'm not going to be as detailed as russell but i will tell you what i've experienced uh uh which a lot of it's a lot of the same that russell has, has uh, indicated already but on the first slide here shows our healthy soils grant. And we've done several presentations so far uh, from wildfire to uh, uh, different types of rangeland management to certain results to, you know, to this particular one. And when Joel and I were talking, I go, I want to focus on soil. Let's, I mean, it's a healthy soils grant. Let's talk about soil. Uh, Peter could go on for probably one or two days on what he knows about soil. And it was just, you know, there's just so much information just in this one seminar that we're doing uh, that's that's going to be able, we're going to take a, you know, be able to go back and look at it and get quite a bit of information. But this is our particular uh, uh, grazing, this picture, this first slide is showing our particular units. What I'm excited about these particular, uh, this is for our Healthy Soils grant, is these particular uh, units that you see here, one, two, three, four, five, and six, these are actually areas that have not been a part of our existing grazing program that we've been doing uh, and have been sitting fallow. These areas have burnt uh, for about, uh, well, burnt uh, in the wildfires and are partially type converted. Fields one, two, three, four, and yeah, one, two, three, and four have all been heavily farmed. So they have been farmed for 120 years. Rancho Hamul is actually a reserve that uh, used to be a Spanish land grant here in San Diego County. And, uh, and so it has a history of farming and, and uh, grazing already. Uh, the property was taken over in 98 by CDFW. Uh, all livestock had already been re removed and uh, it's been uh, sitting fallow since then. So um, our grazing plan basically is dealing with it through CDFA, is dealing with these particular sites. What I would like about these particular sites as you'll see in our next slides is that we've got, uh, we've got uh, containment areas set uh, that are set up where uh, the cattle have been excluded and you can actually, uh, we'll be able to see that the progress as, as grazing occurs on these grounds, uh, the positive effects of it. Next slide. This is one of our, uh, this is field three. This is a, a field that has uh, been sitting fallow. It, it's, it's about two and a half, well, it's more like three, three and a half feet of just built up vegetation and thatch. Uh, our type of grazing is considered to be uh, more of a passive uh, type of restoration. 
uh, since we are, we're not doing a, a controlled burn and then coming back and graze, we're just starting with grazing. Uh, like uh, Russell said, when you have uh, your vegetation that's dormant, there's not a whole lot of uh, nutritional value for cattle. So we supplement uh, to a certain extent, uh, a certain number of months when the, we see the, the vegetation in this kind of state, uh, there's just, it's, it's a, just above straw. There is some, uh, there might be some a little bit more in protein, but not much. So you have to watch your cattle as a producer, uh, what's going on with these types of, uh, this type of restoration, uh, because you need to monitor their health and uh, keep them going. We have a cow-calf operation. So we have a start to finish uh, product that we're providing to uh, local customers on, on a share basis. Uh, so this is our first time grazing in, in, in 20 years. Uh, this is a field that I'm excited about because I, I feel it's gonna produce some good vegetation down the road. Let's do the next slide. This is the same slide on the left there. That's after we removed them, uh, after they've cleared off all the thatch, the years of thatch, all the years of just material that's just been sitting there on top of the soil and not incorporated into the soil. So what's happening is with our clearing the vegetation off, uh, the dry matter and everything else, we provided manure, we've opened up the, the soil to get some sun, a little bit of sun. Uh, there is a residual dry matter to where enough to where it's still considered to be covered. A lot of it is laying down, it's not standing up straight. Uh, but what'll happen is my next year, even on a low rainfall year, I'll get, I'll get a good growth out of this particular, uh, this particular unit, pasture three. On the right here, you can see where uh, it's the same field. This is our containment area. And what's important to see is how much vegetation these animals are removing and actually providing to help jump our ecosystems that have been semi-dormant uh, while they're in a state of just being fallow. So what happens is we're stimulating the soil, we're, we're not there year round, uh, we're grazing, we're resting, and then moving on to another paddock. So what's gonna happen is uh, we'll, we'll see the difference here in the spring. We don't know how much rain we're gonna get. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an unknown factor, it drives us producers crazy because we can't do a whole lot about drought other than doing what we're doing on our grazing and resting and try to reduce the effects of drought on our properties and on our livestock. So um, let's go ahead and go on to the next picture. This is a, this is a picture that we moved into another. Now this, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that prior, the prior field three was a, uh, a farm prop, uh, area. So that was farmed for about 120 years. Heavy duty disking, heavy duty, you know, fertilizer, everything else, all traditional ag was happening at that point. Uh, this is an area here, this pasture six has not been farmed. It's been just grazed. I've got different types of vegetation already in here. There's some brome. Uh, I've got purple needle grass. I've got deer grass. I've got salt grass, perennials, and some natives that are in this, this field. Now, we didn't know that until I removed this material here off to the left. So this is when we first moved in. Uh, on the left, and this is where we uh, are, are uh, when we were finished is on the right. And when we found out, when we moved them and in October, we had a few shots of good rain. I had quite a bit of salt grass and, and purple needle grass that actually was starting to get stimulated by just ret through the rest period here. So what's happening is, I, my point is, you don't know what's really there on the left until we get the vegetation removed and we see what's, what's underneath and what's gonna grow. So um, I had water troughs there at one point. Go back one, yeah. Off to the off to the right there. NRCS is our main is our main funding arm for infrastructure for our, our uh, through the Equip program uh, for our our pro our project our our ranch. So they provided solar wells. They provided uh, some help with our internal wildlife fencing. Uh, since we're on a reserve, we need to make sure the deer can flow and wildlife can flow from one paddock to another without any uh, interruption. Go ahead. And go to the next. Uh, this is also field six off to the left. You can see the vegetation that we've had here uh, that's still that we've left uh, after we've moved out. And on the right is our containment area. You can see the vegetation that's there. I've got mustard. I've got all kinds of just 
all kinds of junk on there. So it's all, uh, it's, it's going to be pretty cool to see in the spring, the different types of vegetation that will be coming up and improving as we, as we continue to go on year after year. Um, the other thing is that what's important is that um, I can have growth, but it's not necessarily a good vegetation. So what's happening is for me, actually getting the, the soil um, disturbed a little bit, having manure and the cows in there and, it, and it actually incorporating any type of residual dry matter that's left over into the soil is creating a composting situation but it's not it's gonna be as quick as if you did compost. It's gonna be over time. And I think it's the same with our carbon sequestration is that on this type of operation, I'm still storing carbon, but maybe not at the same rate as something else. But on a rotational grazing basis, this is what we can afford to do as a family to go ahead and try to provide a good healthy product and try to make a living, which is important because we have to do both. And, uh, and especially when we're managing properties now for going on, and as we're teaching younger people like my sons how to manage and take care of these properties, we need to understand that, that that's, that's important. So we have to take care of our lands. We have to be watch what's going on with them. We also need to understand the science behind it because as a producer, to be honest with you, I didn't start off understanding any of this stuff seven years ago. I just said, why is this group more green than the next paddock? Why is this different? I started asking questions, why, why? So those are all things that are now coming out through science that are, uh, are the reasons why these things are happening. So I'm pretty excited for our future uh, as far as grazing and, and the many aspects of, of the positive effects of, of it through a managed grazing program and the grazing and resting. Uh, which is what we do. Is there another slide or is that it? Well, um, our next slide here gives you a sense of how extensive grazing used to be in San Diego. Um, 250 years ago, this was the main industry in San Diego. And up until about 20 years ago, that's what the activity that was happening at the property that John is managing right now. Um, so our role at the Resource Conservation District and the reason why we're involved in this project is we really believe there's a lot more potential to be implementing these types of practices at a wider scale, um, both to improve the productivity of working lands, but also to as a way to address diversity, biodiversity needs. So currently only three quarter, uh, one quarter of that historic extent is being actively managed by grazing. And we're really advocating for active management. And one way we're doing that through this grant is through um, monitoring some of these uh, soil quality um, and environmental uh, factors that, that Peter was mentioning. Um, so we are taking uh, uh, two soil samples each year, one before grazing occurs and one after grazing occurs in each pasture. So here's a snapshot of what that looked like from last December. Um, you can see that as John mentioned, that field that uh, was not farmed, uh, pasture six over here on the right, um, it has substantially more soil organic matter uh, as a percentage of the, the soil mass than um, than most of the other sites. Um, and also something to note is that these, uh, the effects of these, uh, as John said, uh, they develop over time. So um, whereas adding compost, you see that immediate result here, we see that a lot of the treatment and control sites still have quite similar levels of soil organic matter, but we expect that, to, that difference to increase over time. We're also monitoring the infiltration rate of water going into the soil, anticipating that that will um, increase and that the soil column will store more water over time. Uh, we're measuring the average stubble height, both in those control sites and treatment sites. Um, and the pastures range from about 50 to 500 acres. Um, four of them have control plots, as John had mentioned, and those control plots are each one acre. So we're really able to track uh, what's the difference between an area that's been um, just left on its own and an area that's being actively managed through grazing. Um, and while we don't have long-term results at this local site, I wanted to share with you what that looks like um, from other studies uh, around the globe. Um, one takeaway 
um, is that um, continuous grazing um, and, and not doing this rotational method through pastures degrades soil organic matter. Um, and in a collection of sites of ranches from around the, the globe, soil organic matter was greatest in areas that had paddocks or in ungrazed areas. Um, and it was lowest in areas that were continuously grazed. And as Peter mentioned, this only matters in the upper portion of the soil column. Um, also infiltration usually increases um, as soil organic matter increases. And that's because that disturbance that John had mentioned as this, the surface of the soil is disturbed to some degree, it enhances um, or the reduced amount of disturbance enhances uh, biological activity. So a little bit of disturbance allow, allows um, those microbes in the upper layer of the soil to do uh, their work better and improve the infiltration. And lastly, um, this is not a one size fits all approach that depends on the expertise of the rancher. And that's because the amount of carbon that can be stored in the soil depends on how in, um, intense the grazing is, but it also depends on the climates where that's being done. And so we're working in a dry, warm climate. This is a sensitive area. And so only um, grazing at low to medium intensities um, and essentially leaving a certain amount of stubble is what's going to result in uh, increasing that soil organic matter. And so these are some of the long-term goals that we're trying to, to reach that have been seen in, in other parts around the globe. And we'll share these references with you after the meeting. Um, uh, one more comment before we move on. Yeah, Joel, thanks. Yeah, I want to make sure uh, uh, in my particular situation that <clears throat> I work closely with CDFW regarding the managed grazing on, on this particular reserve. There's things that we want to go ahead and uh, be in certain areas during certain timing. Uh, certain areas, they want us to reduce more vegetation uh, to a painfully low <laughs> a situation, but it's actually good for what the wildlife that they're targeting to uh, improve. Uh, and they've had great success with that as well. I, I want to make sure you understand that it's not uh, it's not un, unfounded. It's actually uh, gone real well for the Burrowing Owl Project for CDFW. They've uh, they've really done a bang up job with that, and we've been a part of that. So it's been uh, that's kind of fun for us. Uh, um, our some of our joy is to see the wildlife that's out on this property on this reserve, and knowing that we're taking care of it and seeing the wildlife there as well. And uh, it's cool. And CDFW has really uh, been very, very good with our with our family and in, uh, in uh, help managing this this property. But I do communicate with them very frequently in different areas of uh, grazing, as far as where to graze, what to do, and we're still and that's ongoing. It's not just a one and done deal. It's it's an ongoing uh, process as far as uh, uh, managing the property. So anyway, I want to make sure I, I said that. Great. Well, um, thanks so much, John. We really appreciate the work that you've put in there. You're the one who knows what's happening on the ground, and we appreciate the opportunity to work with you. Absolutely. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> um, so for those of you whose um, interest is piqued by these various topics, we've got three different breakout rooms for you to join. Um, the first of these is going to be um, a discussion um, from the perspective of what ranchers can do um, to implement these practices um, and make working lands more actively managed. Um, and that's going to be led by John um, and also Russell. So if you're interested in ranching, um, in, in the ranching discussion, you can join that first breakout room. The second one will be um, with Peter and Palayo. And the focus there will be how scientists and researchers um, can contribute to developing these best management practices so that um, grazing lands and rangelands are more actively managed. Um, and if you'd like to take the perspective of a partner organization, such as a nonprofit, or um, I work at a government agency, uh, a local government agency, um, something like that, you'd be welcome to join me in the third breakout room. Um, and so uh, in order to join those breakout rooms, just go to the bottom of your screen. Um, and over there, you'll see um, a, an icon with four squares that says breakout rooms. You can click on that and then choose to join that room. Um, so if you have any questions, Cody is going to stay in this main room um, and you can shoot her any questions you may have. And if you don't know where to go, she'll shoot you over to another room um, either way. Um, we're going to take uh, 10 minutes in these breakout rooms and see you back here at 340 for a more general discussion. Um, just one last thing while you're in those rooms, please think about um, 
these different practices that you've learned about today or that you've seen today and think how they might actually um, be useful in your community, on your land, how you might implement them. So please enjoy and, and we'll see you in just a minute. Hello. Great talks. Hi. Those were really good. Glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah, we've been following your work out at the Rancho Amul fairly closely. Probably could follow closer, but. <laughs> it's not too hard when you drive by on 94. Everybody kind of eyeballs to see what's going on. So. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've managed the uh, Ramona Grasslands Preserve, the non-county one, the smaller one that's like 200 acres. Uh-huh, good. How are things Pretty going there? Pretty good. Good. Yeah. The Burrowing Owls, they had 20 fledglings this spring. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. They great. laid eggs in every artificial burrow we put out. <laughs> that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. yeah Only five the... of them were successful, five nests. but You will. <laughs> it worked yeah. out pretty well down there, so I'm not sure why it wouldn't work up there. But uh, it's a pretty neat thing. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're trying to figure out how to graze better. Like last year, we were a little late getting the cattle out there. Yeah. yeah. And boy, I was amazed how quickly the grass sprung up to knee high. So it, we had to do a lot San of San Diego County. It gets it gets uh, with the program and big time in March and April. It just uh, almost 30, 45 days. It'll grow a foot and a half to two if we've got some good moisture. It's uh, it's pretty fertile ground, but that's just our, it, that's just our area. You know, it's, we're kind of semi-arid, we're in a desert and it just goes to, to you know, when we get a little moisture uh, under our managed grazing program, you know, we, like uh, Russell showed, we just don't have a whole lot of, uh, you know, we still have pretty significant growth of vegetation on our paddocks that are being in a, that are currently in a state of rest. And when I look at those and I watch them, just I can't physically get to every single paddock to try to knock it down uh, or, you know, get to our weeds or whatever that we're trying to do at that point in time. Burrowing owls are our priority. Uh, so we obviously hit that. We run two herds. We run a, a stalker yearling herd and, a, um, and our cow calf herd. So we, we try to juggle everything around, try not to hit the same paddocks every year at the same time so that we can hit different uh, vegetation at the different times of the year. And then also make sure we take care of the, of the, the burrowing owls so in that rotation. So you get pretty creative, but it does work, does work well. But that, that 45 time, day time period will really create a lot of growth, um, a lot of growth in the vegetation. It's already hard enough to try to, to run a ranch and when you get all your moisture in like three months <laughs> and then yeah. have to it for the whole, for the 12 months as a, as a producer, you know, it, it's really, you know, it's, uh, we're finally seeing some moisture, you know, showing up on the, on the weather reports, which makes us feel a little bit better <clears throat> rather than having nothing or next, nothing in the 10 day report. It's just like, man, I could have, I could have chosen a better profession. <laughs> <laughs> It's just like, yeah, so anyway, but uh, yeah. Do you think that growth can happen earlier in the year? Because I've been a little panicked already this year, but maybe I'm premature. Well, and... for in San Diego County, like in Russell's area, they can get, like if we, down on our, well, in Ramona, you're in Ramona, right? Ramona mm -hmm. gets 15 to 18 inches a year. That's the average, I think, you know, down on my place, I get 12, you know, I have had the same, but if I can get between seven and eight, like last year I had nine, <clears throat> I can actually get through a rotational uh, period without feeding hay, but I have to put out supplement like Russell does. Uh, but our vegetation is there to keep, to carry us over, hopefully till, <clears throat> excuse me, till the next uh, rain season comes. And that's, you know, oh, wow. You don't know, you know, we had two early rains, we got germination and then nothing in October, you know, start of October. So yeah. uh, you just don't know. I don't have a, you know, I don't have a, a magic 
crystal ball or anything. And, and really it, it just, it just really, you know, throws it in your face how much mother nature is in control, not me, you know, and all I can do is do things to try to reduce any negative effects from that, but you can still get a good, you know, we can still have a decent rain year and you can still have quite a bit of vegetation here starting in December. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. I don't know um, how, how, how you are, Russell, up in your area. Yeah, we had like 1.3 inches. Uh, I think it was back in October, the grass started and then a lot of it's died. Um, still taking advantage of that little bit that's in that dry residual grass, but really looking forward to this next rainstorm that's coming in about a week. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, we're supposed to get a quarter inch on Thursday. And that's what I'm wondering if it gets above, it's like 60 degrees, right? The grass will start to grow. Yeah, in the high so, 60s, high 60s when it gets cold. <clears throat> excuse me when it gets cold uh you get uh reduced growth it's just stunt it's not stunted it's just a slow growth but when you start getting above 65 to 70 degrees you're going to get some growth and i think that's really important as far as understanding how your growth is going to grow so for example this year we had where well, we had excuse me mm -hmm. We had the early rains and we had early germination. <clears throat> the grass and the range was stressed. Um, the roots are still there. Um, you got moisture still in the ground, uh, which is just from our past practices. <clears throat> so we'll see what comes back after we get some rain. I won't have the same thickness or pounds per acre as a result of it, uh, even though if I have a good rain year. So that's just how, you know, the, we, that's just, what I've noticed on our particular property, when I got to the point where we had 21 or 22 inches of rain down on my property, <coughs> we could barely move the cattle from paddock to paddock. And I didn't even get to each paddock. Wow. There, was so much, there was so much vegetation, so much growth uh, that had happened, you know, um, that I'm just like, you know, this is ridiculous, you know? So we had to increase AUMs numbers, all that stuff to try to really just managing the property uh, the right way. And then, of course, when it all goes dormant, it becomes a wildfire hazard, you know, so we have to go ahead and manage for that. So we have a wildfire management program, grazing program as well, which is uh, we developed with a, a brief conversation with Cal Fire, who's directly across the street from us. So we have about so a minute. Oh, go ahead. Obviously, we have like a minute left if there's any you know, more questions that people have, but go ahead. I'm just, just wondering how quickly would you want, think to get the cattle in after this quarter inch of rain if it's above 65 degrees? If we really don't want it to get too tall again, would you say a month is too late? Like, is January going to be too late? I can't tell you. It depends on how much moisture we get. So you... I mean, if you get quite a bit of moisture in December and January, you have to go out there and just watch it, you know, take a look at it, see what it's gonna, what's gonna happen. <laughs> usually, traditionally, we're cold in, in December and in January. It's not a super, usually they're not, I mean, it's usually not this warm. A quarter inch isn't gonna bring a lot right now. We're talking, I'm talking about inches, you know, like an inch, okay. maybe two inches next week. You know, your ground's gonna be moist and go from there. We can talk so more about one... it later in case somebody else has some questions. I don't want to cut them sure. off, but I mean, and you're welcome to contact me directly. Okay. Thank uh, you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else have some questions? I have one question for you, John and, and Richard, both, and you may want to reserve this for later. I was wondering what, if you could, what is your favorite monitoring technique and could you would you choose one to maybe a handful that you really want to do more often than not? Well, for myself, I really like to keep it simple. And if I don't keep it simple and I don't, I don't do it, just taking photographs, you know, out in the distance and then straight down for the grass that's right below you. That's the easiest thing for me to do. For me, I, I love photo monitoring because photo monitoring can basically, you know, it, it, the, the pictures really don't lie. And uh, the vegetation is going to tell the story. Like Russell said, you can just, the, his pictures that he had 
are, are basically showing the, a healthy ecosystem along with healthy vegetation. That's, you know, we're talking about a healthy soil. When you get healthy vegetation <clears throat> as a result of a healthy soil with a healthy ecosystem, then we have some good looking cattle out there. We have some, uh, and, and they produce a good, good healthy product. Uh, thanks for joining today. I've just started recording so that people can join as well. And Christina, that's all right that you don't have um, audio. We'll be watching the chat if you have any contributions um, to you, for you to share right there. So um, yeah, let's quickly do a, a little round. There's not too many of us here, but it, it'd be great to hear where everybody's working and um, their relation to grazing. So I'll start out. My name is Joel Kramer. I work at the Resource Conservation District in San Diego. Um, and, uh, and I'm working with John Ostell at Rancho Hamul. Um, Ali, I'll pass it on to you. What brings you here today? Hi, everyone. Sorry, I hope I joined the right room, um, but I'm an environmental scientist at CDFW, so I was listening in on the grazing panel today to just kind of learn more about that, um, especially down here in the San Diego area. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of here to listen and learn. I'm happy to meet everyone. Great, thanks, Ali. Um, we have a comment from Christina. She is uh, works on the Board of Forestry and Fire Protection and staffs the Rangeland Management Advisory Committee. It's doing great work um, to make um, grazing and, and rangeland work much more uh, relevant um, today. Uh, she's also uh, certified as a rangeland manager and is previously a field ecologist. So definitely falling into that partner support organization category. Um, Alicia Watkins, can you tell us more about your connection to grazing? Hi there, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Okay, good. Um, I'm a park ranger with the County of San Diego uh, out of the Ramona Preserves. So we are, our flagship site is Ramona Grasslands Preserve. And um, we do have active grazing within the preserve. So I'm just trying to learn more about it and management. And we actually have, um, grazing leases going out to bid currently. So we kind of are expecting that the rancher, that we'll be getting a new rancher in, which will probably likely mean a lot more management for us as a team. So uh, we're trying to learn all we can. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alicia. Um, Colin, I know we've met before, but um, can you introduce yourself to the group? Yeah, thanks, Joel. Uh, I'm, I'm based out of San Diego. I have a little bit of connection with uh, John and, and Rancho Hamul. I work with a local nonprofit that does mostly uh, youth environmental education there at Rancho Hamul um, and a number of other uh, national wildlife refuge and other uh, conservation areas in the San Diego County. Um, but I also work, uh, you know, I've got a couple other connections, I guess, to this type of thing. I work with um, East African uh, pastoralists um, in Kenya and Tanzania a little bit. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, different ownership and, and management settings for uh, rangelands. And um, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, so the Markegard family farm is is one that's pretty darn familiar to me. Um, and I work in outreach and communications, kind of as a an environmental educator, and and also in you know making films and and doing photography and stuff like that. So I'm just very interested in building markets for you know just how is how does how would the public know you know like why is why is maybe the audubon certification so great why why would i buy this type of product and i think there's just a huge majority of the public that would just have no idea why to you know why would paying a little bit extra or or whatever for this type of product matter like what would they be contributing to other than just having kind of the best food, like what would, what would the conservation value of these types of meat products and whatnot be? So yeah, that's, that's a huge part of this work is really trying to help people value those ecosystem services that it's really not just about the product itself, but um, how it is actually improving the land. So um, I I think we're running a little low on time, but I'm going to invite uh, Leigh, Tracy, or Ms. Mr. and Mrs. Watkins um, to uh, let us know what are you thinking um, on the lands that you work on that some of the practices um, 
that you've seen, how could those be implemented in a beneficial way? Any thoughts from some of those who haven't spoken yet? Marty. I apologize. I, I missed much of uh, this uh, workshop before we got into our breakout rooms, but I would just like to say, sort of answering your question in a roundabout way, uh, I work for a company called Point Blue Conservation Science as a part of the Working Lands Group. And so for the past decade or so, they've developed the rangeland monitoring network, um, but they've mostly been focused in central and northern California. I'm the, like the first representative down here in southern California. Uh, and right now we are currently looking for field sites throughout the state to kind of test and gather data uh, regarding that question you asked. Um, about beneficial rangeland practices and developing field monitoring methods that are easy for ranchers themselves to use. Tracy, I've got some land for you. Oh, great. I will give you my contact information and we can be in touch about that. That would be awesome. Marty, can you tell us about your land and, and some of the practices you're considering implementing? Yeah, um, so I work for the Metropolitan Water District down in Los Angeles and we bought, I guess, close to 10 years ago, 20,000 acres in the Sacramento River Delta. Um, and it's all used to be Thule Marsh land. And since they started farming it in the late 1800s, we've lost 25 feet of elevation. Um, for, so we're now 25 feet below sea level across four different islands in the Delta. Um, and as the ocean keeps rising and the land keeps falling, the levees are increasingly at risk. So we're looking at different ways to stop the subsidence, stop the oxidation. And uh, they're currently being farmed mostly in corn with some alfalfa and a little bit of grazing on there. Um, and we're, we actually have a grant to look at um, different ways to stop the subsidence, which will likely include uh, returning some of it back to wetlands, uh, as well as putting rice in. But I've been pushing for regenerative ag as a way to do this. And we have two different farmers on two different islands that are grazing right now, um, one of which is very interested in trying holistic managed grazing, and the other is reluctantly agreeing to do it. So I wanna set up some pilot projects on two different islands to do that. Thanks, Marty. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, having those demonstration projects and um, the, the research really helps to prove that this is important to implement. Um, Christina, I'm gonna highlight you for a moment here. I know that you're doing a lot of other types of support work in terms of making training uh, managers to uh, be better able to implement these contracts or to manage contracts like this. It'd be great to hear a comment from you in the chat about um, another form of support for implementing these practices. Um, is there anything else, um, anyone out there um, who uh, has ideas other than outreach and education and research um, that might better uh, support the scaling up of some practices like prescribed grazing um, or compost application that we've seen today. Last thoughts. <laughs> Hi, this, so this is Lee CBM, the Regional Range Program Manager and Wild and Horse Borough Coordinator for the uh, California Forest Service. Uh, we are actually looking at a statewide um, IDIQ contract for targeted grazing. Um, the impetus was goat grazing, but after reading uh, Davi's, I can't even not think of her full name, blog on the use of cattle. I, I wrote the state of statement of work to incorporate any livestock. So if somebody wants to bring alpacas out to graze for um, weed control or vegetation treatments, um, we're going to be open to that. So it's something um, we're trying to do. So I, I keep um, spouting it about it every chance I get. Thanks so much, Lee. Interesting to hear how that progresses. Um, I think we're running low on time now, but I've got plenty to share. And if you have more questions, um, we're coming up on the discussion when it'll be a great time to ask them to the whole group. So thanks everybody for participating. I'll, I'll see you in the main room. I hope uh, 
people had some fruitful discussions. Uh, I know that my group had a lot of really cool ideas about things happening around the state. So, um, yeah, our, our main our main question was uh, how can some of the practices that you saw today in the discussion um, be implemented in your community or on your land? And um, maybe we'll start out with Russell and John. Um, what are some of the ideas that came up in your breakout group? Russell, did you want to take take that one? Or is oh, it... um, um, <laughs> I don't know what to say here. Um, go ahead, John. Yeah, it, it really our our uh, our conversation was was mostly dealing with the growing owl owl, owl project and uh, what was going on there and the timing of uh, growth of vegetation. So um, to to manage a certain for a certain species. So um, that pretty much dominated ours, our, our conversation, but, <clears throat> and then there was somebody that asked really what their, what our favorite type of monitoring was for, uh, uh, for both Russell and myself. So that seemed right, Russell? Yeah. Yeah. All right, um, well, um, my group, which was meeting with partner organizations, um, had some really great ideas, and a lot of them centered around having demonstration sites um, that where there's active research going on, where um, outreach and education can occur. And that's because, um, as uh, Colin was explaining, people don't, at the consumer um, level don't necessarily understand um, the value of the ecosystem services that are being provided when the land is managed this way. Um, and so really um, being able to show from the ground up what the impact is, is really helpful. And so we had several people speak. Uh, Marty Meisler is in the Delta. He has 23,000 acres that he's trying to reverse subsidence in through these practices. Um, and um, we also had uh, someone with active grazing bids, I think it was Alicia, um, and in Ramona you know, Grasslands, who's starting to look at manage, managing things in their new contract. And then Lee is looking at a statewide grazing contract. So we really have a lot of opportunities right now um, through partner organizations to really encourage this work and scale it up. Um, Peter and Palayo, uh, from the researchers and scientists, what were some of the ideas about implementing some of these practices locally? So I kind of deviated from the topic because there were some questions um, that were asked. One was about, well, which is kind of, it is relevant to the topic uh, about riparian riparian areas and, and how important they are for not only uh, bird habitat, but other wildlife species species as well. But um, there are um, you know, fewer incentives for, for ranchers to, uh, to do work on, on riparian areas. And for them, you know, they're important from a forage perspective and they provide shade, but, um, but again, uh, from a management perspective, uh, they may, may fall like kind of low on their, on their list of priorities. Um, we also talked about um, carbon sequestration on, on grasslands and how important grasslands can be as a, as a carbon sink. And then the connection between healthy soils and, and, and carbon content and, and water and how um, the more soil organic matter, the more carbon the soil has, the more water it can actually um, capture as well. Uh, we also, um, Peter, anything else? We, uh, we talked about um, compaction. Yeah, there was there was also a question um, about uh, I think actually you asked it, uh, Palayo, about um, how, how can grazing be beneficial to soil properties, and th that that actually would be a, a a topic that would be good just to explore that one. I think on its own, I think we could we could go at it, go at it from the other from the other side, and and I, and I I said that uh, I think that that grazing is actually beneficial. Especially the way we're proposing it now, where, you, where you're leaving animals in a for a, you're concentrating them, but not keeping them there in a, in a particular area for a long period of time. But all that, all the nutrients that are supplied there, particularly if the if the soil is not in a, in a in a moist, excessively moist state, will actually benefit those properties. You know, you're, you're providing the, the cows are providing uh, pressure on the on the ecosystem to produce. They're putting nutrients back into that. But yet you're not you're not being you're allowing the soil to be resilient, and the soil wants to be resilient. Naturally, it probably is, but that's that goes back into our input 
our, our active management that I alluded to. Um, moving those animals out maybe when, when, when the conditions aren't right, when we're actually going to be, instead of improving the soil qualities, we'll actually be, be, be doing, we'll be neutral or negative as far as, as far as improving them. So that was something that we, we just, I said about as much there as I, as I just said now, but that seems like a, a, a discussion that might be worth having as well. Yeah, we'd love to dig into this more. And well, Peter, as P uh, questions come to us um, following the presentation, we'll be glad to send them your way as well. Um, Cody, were there some questions that came up in the chat that might, we might have a chance to answer? Yeah, yeah, we did have a couple of questions uh, in the chat. I can read out some answers for y'all. The presenters got back to me already. Um, so a couple of you had uh, questions about can annual ranges truly be maintained in a vegetative state? Um, and uh, Russell had some input uh, mentioning that when we rotate the pasture quickly, we can keep it in a vegetative state longer. So um, that seems to be <clears throat> kind of an answer for there. And then um, someone had a question for Russell again, as he was speaking about uh, his compost application. And uh, I believe Russell, you said it was a quarter quarter inch that you added on top of the rangeland, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, uh, someone was asking about the price of that um, and he shared that it was about $1,000 an acre, which covered the compost cost as well as spreading it. Um, but again, looking into your local provider um, and as we have some more compost available here within the next year um, in California, uh, with the SB1383, that might even be different. There might be some options for um, less expensive or even free compost. So that's something to keep on your radar. Um, and someone did also ask about after managed grazing, I see that mustard and thistle declined. Did native grass and forb abundance and diversity increase? Um, and Russell's answer to that was, we are primarily seeing annual grasses and the belief that with more time, they'll see perennial grasses and potentially oak trees. So those were some of the questions in the chat that we had. Um, we also had one unanswered, Palayo, I'm wondering if you'd be able to answer that for us about um, how does someone measure resilience in the bird friendly index, that sort of um, new quantifier you mentioned. Yeah, uh, you want me to answer that now? Yeah. Yeah, so it is the bird friendliness index. It is, it is complicated. It has um, so a lot of different parameters going into it. Some of them are things like uh, net primary productivity, climatic water deficit, um, the resilience part, as, as I understand it, and, and <laughs> I'm claim to understand the whole index, I'm still learning. Um, it does have a lot to do with, with functional diversity. Um, in other words, the more functional diversity that a, that a community harbors, the more resilient that community is. That's the way. Uh, but it, it is. Uh, I can send you or share with with uh, with all of you the um, an article that describes how the performance index was developed and, and how we use it for the for the ACR ACR program. It is it is complex, but um, again, a lot to do has. Uh, has a lot to do with with functional uh, diversity. Thank you. Um, and then just a reminder for everybody, we'll be sending out the slides as well as these questions and answers and tons of resources after this. So um, you'll have lots of opportunity to dig deeper if something really sparked your interest. So thank you, Palayo. Uh, I just wanna give the stage back to, to the presenters. Um, are there any take home messages that, that you would share to really encourage people to experiment with these methods um, on your land? Uh, you know, something I really admire about John and it seems like what Russell's done as well is that um, really innovative spirit and that desire to improve things and take a, a chance with something new. So um, I'd love to hear from all of you how, how you think uh, others might, might try that as well.
Yeah, yeah, I think oftentimes just starting small um, and and going from there. And oftentimes a lot of the things that I'm trying to implement and trying to get results on, I'm going down this one path and then I look over here and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm getting some other results over here. So oftentimes it's things that I'm not really expecting to happen are all of a sudden happening, like having oak trees grow. It's like, I was not expecting that to happen for quite a few years. Um, So just being open to seeing what's, uh, what's happening around you as you're changing practices. That's great. Keeping that scientific observation going. That's, you know, everybody has that tool available to, you, to them as long as they use it. Um, Palayo, Peter, um, any, any take home messages that you might share? I'm afraid to get started saying anything more. I'll just keep going on and on. Maybe, <laughs> maybe if you invite me back. <laughs> I, I think for me is is the kind of like we, we opened this webinar with this idea that management is, is essential. We, we, we have to manage these landscapes in order to get uh, you know what what the values and the services that that we want from them and, and in order to foster those ecological and promote those ecological processes. Um, we have to actively manage and, and ranches are, are you know, <laughs> our best bet in, in California. There are built-in managers of, of the land. So the more we can incentivize, the more we can provide the technical assistance and the signs that John was talking about to show, you know, what's, what's good management, what's not so good management. Um, I, I think that, that for me is, is, is a really good take-home example. We have, there's a, sorry, take-home message. Um, we have a lot of unmanaged land in California, uh, and 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 we pay for it one way or, or or the other. So yeah, we we pay when we don't manage land. We have to pay to manage land, but but we also pay when we don't, um, with with all these externalities and, and and ecosystem deservices, right? That's good, Bly. I that you you kind of hit the nail on the head that there is. When you have an active management program like this, there is an economic uh, value to our management on these properties. And it's important that, that we kind of figure that out. It's, it's tough to put a number on at this point, but there is, there is, you know, there is an economic value to ecosystems management. And for us to get what we want on conserved lands, or private lands, or whatever we're managing, uh, you know, or public lands, uh, whatever we're managing, that word has to kind of get out and trickle down. There's a tendency for us all to get together, and we all kind of understand this fact, and then we, I feel like we preach to the choir type of thing, rather than that word getting out. And uh, the the science that's coming out uh, that's showing the positive advantages of a managed grazing or active grazing program is there. And that's, and that's a great thing. And it's, and it's almost, there's something new coming out all the time, which is actually pretty cool. It's tough to keep up with. But for me, for my take home from today, there was a lot of information that was put out. I'm gonna have to go back and look at it again. I wanna go back and read it again. And to be honest with you, I think as a whole, from all, whether you're a land manager or a commercial cattle producer or a grass, you know, a grass uh, a fed uh, ranch or whatever, take one or two of the gold nuggets that you've got from today's message and try to put it into play. Uh, see how it is. See how it does affect your 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 operation. Uh, and do it start small, like Russell said, and then go from there. And you just don't know. I, I feel that each property probably has its own, uh, uh, not probably, each property has a different result depending on how, what you're doing on that management of that land. And the power of observation, like Russell said, is huge. It's huge. Okay, I'm doing this over here. I'm focusing on this and then you turn around, you got oak trees. Okay. Or you're doing this, you do this, you turn around, I got tricolored blackbirds all over my cattle. Where did those come from? You know, where I mean, they were over here before, but now they're down. They're mixing. So what's you know what's changed? You know, you got different, you know, burrowing owls. Uh, yeah, it was 
you know, we are part of the project as far as vegetation control, but, you know, it was need to be part of that project. And it wasn't really, it wasn't really anything out of my, out of the ordinary for us to do. It was open a gate, put cattle in, let them in there. And they, they, they were, you know, they were symbiotic. So there's so many, and there's a lot that are symbiotic. Uh, the deer that we saw in field six, when we were out there taking pictures that we didn't get a picture of, <laughs> but they showed up. And I'm like, and I was telling you about how great the deer field was. It was like somebody said, cue the deer, the deer came out and then we, we didn't get a picture of it. But I mean, that, that's, what, that's what I'm talking about. So what happens is you have unexpected situations, you know, thank goodness for iPhones, because at least we can, you know, take a quick picture if you can get it up there quick enough. But uh, these are all positive things that are happening on, on these rangelands through, you know, through this grazing, through grazing and resting. And, uh, and uh, the healthy soils, it starts with a healthy soil. It starts with a healthy soil that produces, you know, a, a great ecosystem. And the ecosystem jump starts and bows and then you have good vegetation. It goes all, it translates all, all the way to, you know, wildlife habitat, along with producing a good healthy product that people want. And I think that's important. We also have to make a living. So we have to make a living doing this. So that's, you know, what we want to do is try to figure out what's going to be in our particular operations that's going to fit that we can, uh, you know, still make a living at the same time because ranchers don't make a whole lot of money. <laughs> they don't. Well, I, thanks for cueing me on that, John, because I wanted to tell everybody about some of the opportunities to get um, some funding for this. Uh, both of the ranchers on today have done a great job of taking advantage of opportunities to get support uh, to implement some of these practices. Um, I had it just a minute there. Um, and so um, there's two main funding sources that we're taking advantage of for this. I'm sure there's others out there, but currently there's a program out right now um, from the Department of Food and Agriculture uh, called the Healthy Soils Program. That's what this pro uh, presentation is being uh, offered through and they support practices like prescribed grazing, compost application, um, range planting. Um, and the nice thing about this is they reimburse by the area that it's practiced in. Um, so uh, they'll give you a flat budget to, to implement these practices on a certain amount of land. Um, the caveat there is that they now require you to have a grazing management plan in place in order to apply. So if, if you were ranching or if you're, uh, you were managing land and are thinking of putting it out to a grazing contract, uh, keep in mind that you need to have that grazing management plan or the components of it ready in order to apply. Um, and that application window is closing in the next few weeks, but it comes around every year. Um, the other one is from uh, the USDA, uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service, and that's the EQIP program or the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Um, and the difference in the funding here is that they subsidize the cost of these different practices. They won't pay for the whole thing, but they'll support you They'll split the cost to make that uh, possible, but there's a wide variety of practices that they'll support, and that can include installing new water sources or fencing. Uh, it might even include prescribed burning and complement to complement the prescribed grazing. Um, and this also is um, an application that is recurring. It actually is uh, almost a rolling application because it's available multiple times throughout the year, but it is competitive, um, and so. If you're going to apply, uh, you may not receive it that year, but you'll be in the running for the following year. Um, and they're just making sure that you're having the, the greatest impact on the land for the cost, um, the cost that uh, you're offering. Um, so that's it if you're directly managing the land, but there's lots of ways that all of you can stay involved after the presentation today. This is not our last event in this series. Next month, we're partnering with the Fire Safe Council of Greater San Diego County. Um, on an event about how to mitigate fire with targeted grazing. That is a benefit um, of all the practices that were discussed today um, that uh, wasn't focused on, but uh, it is a, a complete uh, uh, benefit and ecosystem service uh, of these activities. Um, and so at the end of January, I believe on the 27th, um, we'll be having some targeted grazers out to discuss that. Um, and then um, we'd like to invite you to get off of Zoom at the end of March and come out to Rancho Hamul um, for a field day. This is going to be our final field day of the project. Um, and we'll have a chance to, with the, the grass growing, hopefully have some good rains over the next few months and, and really show you what this looks like in person. Um, you can meet all of us and uh, we'd love to connect with you. 
Um, if uh, you're curious about this and want to learn more, we've had several of these events and all those videos are online on our YouTube page. So you'll be able to access that through the Resource Conservation District of Greater San Diego County YouTube page. Um, and the best way to stay up to date on all of these developments, whether it's grant opportunities or events or new information like John was mentioning, is to subscribe to our newsletter. Cody sends that out on a monthly basis. Um, and you can follow this link on our website or um, you'll have the link available in the follow-up email. So I just wanna thank everybody for joining today. It was really great discussing all these topics with you um, and focusing in on that take home message that um, the, the land in order to provide all the benefits that it does needs to be actively managed. And these are some great examples of how ranchers in California are doing that. So thanks to all of our presenters. It was a really real pleasure. I learned a lot from you and thanks for all of our participants for Thank adding a life to it. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. Very good. Great job, everybody. Yeah. Hope to see you all soon. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye.